So uh, while I'm in your class, I don't know how many sessions it's going to be. Um, I'm going to start from the beginning. We're going to do the object orientation. I'm just going to go through the workshop, tell you what the workshop is, and I'm surprised that nobody's here. It's like, that they, what happened? Like, uh, that's the, what was the original population of the class? Okay. All right, so uh, I'll send them a message. I just got, an, uh, got access. So I've changed a few things in, in your, uh, in your um, OOP. If you go to your OOP, uh, if you look at your OOP session, obviously I'm none of those people that you see over there, um, but the course information is here now. Uh, the organization where you get everything, uh, the how-to videos, extremely important to go through these things. I'm gonna explain one by one. So I'll go through all these things and tell you what they are. Um, we are going to go through a brief explanation of what we are going to study this semester. I'm gonna go through essentially in 40 minutes, say 10 to 15 minutes, we go through these and your workshop, what the workshop is. Uh, I'm going to send you an announcement where to submit the workshop. You're going to submit it to me, and I'm going to mark it for now. Uh, so um, you will see uh, uh, it's going to be an announcement coming out. I literally took over like an hour ago, so um, that's, uh, that's why you are not getting it uh, beforehand. I just had time to go through setting up the subject. So you, are, you can actually now see through your grade book, you can see exactly what are you going to have. What are the things that you're going to be marked on? So all the things are in detail in, the, um, in your session. And uh, um, the course information, land, land acknowledgement, uh, they have, have they done the land, land acknowledgement? Okay, beautiful, okay. They did it in the other subjects? Okay, beautiful. So I'm not going to go through that. Um, uh, the GitHub organization is where you're going to live at. So Seneca, so this is where everything's going to be posted. You have done this in IPC 144, I believe, right? You have, okay. So you see over here it says OOP 244 NAA and ZAA notes, okay? I'm going to create a directory over here called NJJ while I'm here. So anything I do in my classes, they are all on Git. Recordings of what we do, everything. So, um, and didn't have time to update it, but as soon as it gets updated, you can actually go through an NA session and see the recordings of every session that I go through. So when the sessions come up, you're gonna see all the recordings gonna be there. And you're gonna have a similar page, and I'm gonna hand it to the next prof. Uh, the workshop, quickly going through it. <laughs> I don't know if you, have, if you have already opened it or not. Uh, just uh, quickly telling you, tell you what the workshop is about. So um, the first one, it's a written program for you, one program written in C line. It's, it's written in C style. The only thing that it uses from C++ is C in and C out, okay? And in the files, uh, there is no file in the first one. Yeah. So. All you need to do is to separate it into modules, recompile it, so you kind of remember what modules are from IPC. You did separate files in IPC. You had header files in IPC, right? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. So what you do in the first one, and the due date is going to be two days from now. So uh, I'm going to set it up. Uh, so it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, midnight is going to be due date for the lab one, which is essentially taking the file that you see in here, hello, uh, taking the file that you see in here, the lab part, okay, taking the file that you see over here, where, that is a working file, you can actually compile and run it and see how it works, break it into a few modules. It's going to be an I.O. module that you are going to put all the input output stuff in it, there's going to be a graph module that's going to be all the stuff involving it, drawing a graph. And there is a main module that will tell you exactly what's in it. So if you browse down in the, in the lab section, in the uh, lab section of the workshop, you will see exactly how, what it says. So in here when it says your prof name and last name and yada, 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 
I don't know why it's not showing the project over here. Let me see. I think it doesn't have the... I'm going to pause myself for a second. We don't have much time for those things. Yeah, so um, you, cre you, you literally open the, uh, open the project and... And you create the modules. So essentially, we are asking you to create an IO module, which means an IO.CPP and an IO.H. Then you're going to have a graph module, which is a graph.CPP, graph.H. All the functions related to IO will go into IO. All the modules, all the, sorry, functions related to graph will go into graph. The prototypes will go into the header file. What is a prototype? What is a prototype of a function? Sorry, I teach it this way. I know, I'm weird. I, I, I keep asking, like, like kindergarten, I ask questions from students. Well, so it's not the definition of it, but it basically just states like what it inputs. Exactly, it just introduces the function. It just tells to all the other, all the other modules what functions are available. So the compiler won't give you an error. So compiler compiles everything peacefully, and when it, it's supposed to link everything, link everything together, it knows that those functions are there and finds them and executes them, right? So that's that one. So you're going to put that one over there, and main, we're going to tell you exactly what. So it literally, I am naming what you need to put over there. But you need to put something in the files to make sure that the header files don't get compiled more than once, because it's impossible to actually go through the header files and make sure that you never include it twice. Maybe you include a header file in a, and an include, and that wasn't included somewhere, and so on and so forth. So when you include two header files, suddenly three copies of them are being included. To fix that problem, we talk to the compiler. So you don't know, but you are writing two programming languages, not one. So every single, and I'm not talking C++, I'm talking C. Sorry I'm talking fast. You don't have much time, <laughs> OK? Uh, when you are writing a program, any command that starts with hashtag, that's not a C language program. That's a compiler program. That's your request from compiler to do something before compilation. OK? And I strongly suggest when I post the first things for the other ZAA and NAA, go see the first two sessions of ZAA and NAA. Uh, the, the codes are all up there and, and, and all the good stuff. So you have all the codes there um, and you'll see. I, I code and I teach, so that's how it works. Uh, so what we need to do, we need to tell to the compiler, hey, this is supposed to get compiled only once. And to do that, I'm going to actually cheat. I'm going to go to, the, to one of the sessions that, that I have, let's say NAA. Let's first be, let me pull this repository. I don't know who's going to take care of your class. I'm sure that there's going to be an, an amazing teacher. But what I want to tell you is that the, uh, uh, the I'm just pulling the repository to update it to make sure everything is here. There we go. Oh. OK, everything's up to date. So I'm just going to open the NAA. Uh, so just to show you what I'm doing, I'm just going to open the NAA session. And I'm going to go here. All right, so uh, the example that I was giving to, to the students over there was something like this, something nuts, actually. So I'll explain it to you, and you'll see exactly what I mean. Let me remove that and add, add the existing item. So I'm going to add in here. I think I'm calling it crazy include, I call it. OK? Now, take a look at this file. It's, this file is called hoohoo.txt. Absolute garbage of a name, right? It has nothing to do with any language. And when you look at it, it's like a half a function there. You see that? 
And take a look at the second one, hi ha dot hu hu. When you look at that, it's the first half of the function. So they are both completely invalid C programs. But if you take one and bring it at the bottom of the other one, what happens? It's a complete program, right? It's a complete program, right? Okay, so just to demonstrate what those hashtags are, I did something like this. So I'm saying include hiha.huhu and include huhu.txt. So essentially I'm asking the compiler to copy and paste because that literally was what include is. Include is nothing but a copy and paste. I'm asking the compiler to copy the first file, paste it at line one, copy the second file, paste it in line two, therefore the combination of both will be the two things that are complete. You don't see it, but when I run the program, three years later when it compiles, you will see it actually says, hello OP244NAA. You translate to NJJ, okay? So something like that. You follow what I'm saying? So essentially what it does, this first include does this. It copies and pastes it at line one, then the second include copies and pastes it at where the second include is. Then the next include comes in, includes IO stream, copies the whole thing over there, and it keeps going like that until no hashtags are left in a, in a file. That's when compilation actually begins. It starts translating your, your, your program to whatever you have. We good? Okay, now because of this fact that things go bananas like this, you don't really, it's impossible to keep track of how many times IO stream is included or, or standard input output is included. Or for, for that matter, any file you write, you, can, you have no control over it. Because of that fact, to make sure that the compile, uh, a header file only gets compiled once, we do this magic. What do we do? We write, if not defined, now we are at Seneca, I put a Seneca at the beginning, then I'll try to create a token that is unique and it's impossible to get repeated. How can I guarantee that it's unique? I come with a pattern and I follow that religiously, which means that pattern is something you're gonna do from now till end of OP345, okay? So first you stick a Seneca at the beginning, you put an underline. Then you bring the name of the header file in all capital, change the dot to an underline. It becomes Seneca underline teacher underline H. Then don't trust yourself to type it again. Copy that line one to line two, change the if not defined to define. And we put an end if at the end. Forget about everything else. Remember hashtag is the language of the compiler. So I'm telling to the compiler, the first time you are compiling it, if that token is not defined, continue the compilation, right? So what happens? The compiler compiles, life is beautiful, it goes through. The second time the file is included, I'm saying if not defined, but in last time it is defined, right? So therefore that file will not get compiled anymore. It guarantees that it happens only once. This is called compilation safeguards that we have to follow. Second thing, namespace. It's something C++, it has nothing to do with C. Namespace prevents repetition of names because our job is to write object-oriented program and create many different classes that represents real things out there. For example, a teacher. If I want to create a teacher, I'm gonna create a structure called teacher, right? But in Seneca College, how many different departments we have? We have an HR department, let's say, and we have an education department. Programmers in HR department are creating a teacher class. What, what and the HR department is interested? What is the contract? How many years experience the person has? What is the salary? Expertise, skills, and stuff like that, right? What does education want? What are the subjects that the person is teaching? What schedules he has in the week? So the, what we call abstraction of teacher from points of view of two different departments are completely two different structures, correct? Right? I always tell to my students, do you care if I'm bald? No, 
You care if I'm a teacher, if I teach properly or not. That's your abstraction from me. Do you care if I can salsa or not? No, because I'm supposed to teach you C++. But if I was your dance teacher, then you cared. You follow what I'm saying? So because the abstractions change in an application, we have to make sure they don't collide. HR cannot name a teacher anything else other than a teacher. Education department cannot teach any set anything other than a teacher. They both have to call them teacher. Therefore, the HR department writes all its code in namespace HR. The education department writes all the code in namespace EDU. In here, to practice that, us as students write their, our codes in a namespace called Seneca. So, in your point of view, an empty header file with nothing in it looks like this. If I wake you up at 4 o'clock in the morning and say, wake up, write a header file for a car. You have to immediately write, if not defined, Seneca underline con under dot H, hashtag define Seneca underline car H, namespace Seneca, and end it. Done. Now you tell me, okay, what do you want me to write? That's an empty header file. Are we clear with this? Two, every header file, mostly, for now, at the end of the semester, we'll find out that there are modules that they're only header files. They don't have a CPP file. But for now, we are only doing CPP. I'm out of breath. Okay, so as you see, the module for the teacher, that is the CPP, it's supposed to be all the functions, that one includes teacher.h, and again, it has another namespace. The difference between a namespace and a structure is that if you have two structures with the same name, they're gonna be a collision. If you have two namespaces with the same name, they are like bubbles. They join and form a bigger bubble, okay? So they, it's not a collision. It simply says, I am writing it in the same namespace. Done. We good? That's your job. So your io.h should have that. Your graph.h should have that. And then you put your header files and your functions in them. We good? Next. Stop me, because I have till 2.30 to be in this class. Uh, and, but the next session is going to be full. I'm going to be the whole thing. But now I have to be here. I have to leave at 2.30. So stop me if I'm talking too fast, and uh, I'll go through it. And I'm recording it, too. And I'm going to post the recording so you can listen to my mumbles uh, afterwards again to see what I'm talking about. Are we good to answer this point? Yes, sir. So. Yeah, yeah, next week, next if week. I'm here, next, no, 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 next week, if I'm here, because I got it half, half an hour ago, okay. I have to go pick up my daughter from school, oh, okay. so, so that's the thing, but next week I can arrange, and we're going to be, hopefully, the, the full, if I am taking care of it, it's going to be full session, okay. okay, and your Friday session, full session, okay, I have to somehow drive from Markham, come over here in five minutes, but I'll do my best, okay, <laughs> anyways, so, so are we good down to this point? All right, so next thing. So yeah, this tells you essentially you have to do what I just told you, okay? And then after you do this, it's going to tell you that in main, you are putting these two functions. Obviously, main doesn't have a header file because nobody uses main anywhere. Main is using everybody, correct? Done. Okay, and in main, you don't have a namespace Seneca. Main uses namespace Seneca. So main always uses the namespaces or that are done in modules. Like you're saying, using namespace STD, it's the same thing, okay? You did the hello world with using namespace, right? No? No? Okay, we'll do it. Okay. So the namespaces are new in C++. When I say new, I mean 15 years, okay? Uh, yeah, so you can create namespaces as you saw, that's the syntax, but if you create a namespace to use a class or a structure or anything that is in it, you have to keep putting the name of the namespace and two columns, it's called scope resolution. Two columns and then the name of the class. You have to keep doing that, that's bothersome. If you don't wanna do that, you're just gonna say at the top of the file, I am using namespace Seneca. So you say using namespace Seneca, it means I don't want to keep typing Seneca, Seneca, Seneca. If you see the name, you can't find it, go look in the Seneca. It's in there, okay? Well, I'll show it to you in a second. So, yeah. 
So yeah, so that's, that's that one. And in here I mentioned IO module should hold the functions print int, int digits, get int, go back, menu, label line, and line. And graph should hold functions get sample, find max, print bar, yada, yada, yada. And this shit, seriously shouldn't take you more than half an hour to do. You just have to organize the code, put them all in here, compile it and submit it and be done with it, okay? If it takes more than half an hour, contact me. I'm on, I'm on Teams, okay? Take a look at my schedule. You can go on uh, scheduling assistant, click on it and take a look at my schedule. You, if you see my status is green or yellow, call me. You don't need to even book an appointment. Yes, sir. I don't need to, it's in there. You can't do anything yet because you don't know who to submit to? Yeah, so as soon as I go home, by end of tonight, I'm not gonna promise immediately I'll do that, but by end of tonight, I send an announcement that this is me and this is how you submit, okay? Okay, so that's that. Yeah, the other one is a bit tricky. So the DIY one is the part that you're supposed to do it yourself. Not really. I gave you 70% of the, of the code. But parts, you have to do it yourself. So over there, we have a structure, actually, for a, for a, for a mark, name, surname, and, and you have a file that is lots of records, like six, 700 records in them, uh, like this. Somewhere I wrote it, I don't know where. Yeah, anyways, it's, it's comma separated. Oh, there we go. You see, the Duncan Anderson, comma, 70. It means that student, the name is Duncan, the, the, the last name is Anderson, and uh, got 70% in something. We don't care, okay? <laughs> something. So your job is to write a file, write a program that goes through that thing, finds out how many of the people in the file got from 91 to 100, how many got from 81 to 90, how many wanted to 71 to 70, and in an array of 10 integers, find those. After you do that, you pass those things to the graph you had from previous one. So you bring the io.h and graph.h from the lab. You bring it over here, you just have to hack the graph to show these numbers at the beginning. That's all. That's for your graph. Number two. The SD marks, and I'm giving you a sort algorithm over here. This is the sort algorithm to be done. And what I want, I wrote it somewhere, is for you to write one function in module SD marks. SD marks has a, just a structure right now in its header file. What you do, I want that, I, I lied. I don't want you to write one function. I need one function. You, you should write many functions that are used to generate this, this print report. What does print report do? It uses the IO graph to print this graph, and then using the file module that is fully written, fully implemented, you load all the data inside, the, uh, inside an array of SD marks, you sort them based on marks, and I gave you the uh, pseudocode for it too, the algorithm how to write the sort, and you sort it, sort it in, a, in a descending order and you show it that way, and that's it, okay? So that's what you do. The first part, don't look at the DIY. Do the first part because you have no coding. When it's, everything is okay, then go to IO and read the functions. Each function has not, uh, very detailed comments and see what they do, okay? Learn what they do so you can use it in DIY. Because we don't know how, we don't know any formatting in, in C still, uh, in C++. Are we okay down to this point? I may give you some extension in DIY. What's the standard deadline? Two days after lab, lab is due. Six days after lab, DIY is due. So you have four days. If DIY is usually very quick. So I will give it two days, but usually you're finished in a day. Um, so, and then the rest is the DIY. DIY is the one that you actually code in it. Yeah. So that would be, uh, it doesn't, you, the, the command, submission command has a dash do at the end. You can add that one. And it tells you in detail what the due dates are. I'll set it up. Again, give me till the end of the day, okay? 
time. All right. Any questions down to this point? All right. So that was the, the, the workshop. Now, uh, the very first thing I'm going to do in here, I'm going to create the NJJ thingy. Come on, come on, come on. All right. I'm going to create the NJJ. thingy in here, so I'm going to go, seriously, there you go, so NJJ, so that's going to be you, and I'm going to, as I, as I mentioned, this is how I teach, so I'll start Visual Studio, create a new project, and by all, but by no means the next prof is going to have this one, don't bug the other guy saying, hey, that one was doing like this, why you're not doing that one? It's, I'm just going to hand these things, and each prof has its own way of teaching, okay? All right, so I'm going to create an empty project. And next, um, I'm going to select the directory that we had, NJJ, select. And today is 01 for me, the first session, and it's January 15th. So that's how you're going to see it. It's, and make sure every time you create, you never check this, never uncheck this checkbox. We are in the kindergarten level of programming. We just want to print five things back to back. We don't want to have a solution with 50 projects in it. So do it like that, then your solution and project are at the same place. Create. All right. And source file. Oh, not that. Source file, add, new item, C++ file, prg.cpp. And then I'm going to have include IO stream, no dot H's, no dot H's in C++. Okay, why? I don't know. Because the sky is high. They, they remove the dot H, okay? So what are we going to do with all the stuff that is coming from C? Like, ST standard library, STDIO. First of all, you know that C++ is a, a, a superset of C, right? It, it's literally C. There is no difference between the two. The, the, they call it plus plus because it has one more feature. You know what that feature is? Object orientation, right? And they, everybody makes fun of the C++ language, saying that even the name has a bug in it because the language should be over and then it's going to be added one to it, right? So anyway, so if you didn't get the joke, fine, but that's a nerdy C, C joke. Anyways, so yeah, if you want to use those, you drop the dot .h at the end, you add a C at the beginning. So C string, C S T D L I B, C type dot C, uh, C uh, S T D I O. So you don't put dot anything at the end, okay? I don't want it right, but, uh, but you have, because uh, uh, the language didn't have, uh, we didn't use namespaces originally, uh, but now that we are using, they said, so where are we going to put all the standard stuff that comes with the language? They said, okay, we're going to create a namespace called STD and put everything in it. So every single code and thing that comes with the language, all the libraries, anything we have, they all are in a namespace called STD. Therefore, because I'm in main and I don't want to keep typing STD, CL, STD, I don't want to do that. I'm lazy. I'm going to say using namespace STD. So I don't have to keep typing STD scope resolution, yada, yada, yada. Okay? So int, int main, no more void inside parentheses. If you don't want to pass anything, don't put anything in there. That means void. Return zero. And if in here, if I didn't have, uh, and I'm going to say C out, uh, welcome to OOP 244 NJJ and new line. So how you read this? Insert into console output, welcome to OOP, and then insert to where? You know that operators in C language always return things, right? If I say A plus B plus C plus D, what happens? A plus B happens, the sum becomes plus 
See, the sum becomes plus d, right? When the operator at line four, this is called insertion operator. When insertion operator is called with anything and c out, it inserts it into c out and returns a c out. That c out picks up the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one. Are we good? And it prints it. So if I didn't have using namespace, then I had to mention over here STD scope resolution, and in here I had to mention STD scope resolution. Well, because I have the using namespace, I don't need to put those things. Control Z, Z, Z. Oh, are we good? Yeah. Let me compile and run it three years later. I'm lucky that my laptop was charged because I forgot to bring the adapter. Anyways, so there you go. So as you see, welcome to OP244 and JJ. Are we good? I have 25 minutes to teach you object orient orientation theory and methodology, and I want you to have full years. Everything is being recorded, my dear. And it's going, oh, you're fine. You can take a picture. You don't even need to ask. You want to take a picture? Let me. I'm going to go over there and pose for you if you want. It doesn't matter. But what I'm saying is that everything is being recorded. So you can, uh, you'll see the recording comes on YouTube. Go on YouTube, type Fardad, OP244, 10 years of OP244, 345, Pearl, C, things come up. So you can go over there and uh, look at the uh, recordings from uh, last things. And by the way, seriously, uh, good thing that I remembered. Because things are not ready and I'm like, it's pretty tight in time. In here, if you see, there is a thing says, Fardad's note archive, you see that? If you click over there, you can go to last semester. Where's 22? Oh, I didn't archive it yet? Bad boy I am, I'll do it. But anyways, let's say I go to 2231. I'll put 2237 over there, I forgot. But, and then in here, you, you, if you come over here, you see the recording of all the sessions are here. So session one and two that we missed, you can actually go through it. Workshop zero is mine and mine only. I don't know what the other prof is doing. My students uh, troubleshoot with me using GitHub. We don't do FTP, okay? So if you like, you can follow it. It's good for you. It's good for your health. It makes you visible. You gotta get hired much faster if they see you are an active person on GitHub. I strongly suggest to go through Workshop Zero. And if you add me as a contributor, contributor following Workshop Zero, I'll be honored. And if you have any help till the end of the semester, I'll help you. No questions asked, okay? But uh, it might not be mandatory for your class. Anyway, so, and that's it. So now, object orientation. First, Earth got cold. Then dinosaurs came, ate too much, died. Then programmers came, start programming, right? They were started with a very, very bad way of programming. They created this freaking CPU that didn't understand anything. And to add two, two and two, they had to write 50 lines of code. They got tired of that. They packaged these things that targeted, like writing functions. They packaged them together and named it something, OK? And they called it a language. Fortran came out, PL1 came out, COBOL came out, uh, Pascal came out, C came out, and stuff like that. And then in C, actually, first B came out, but I'll explain. So in, in, in Bell Labs, where you might get your cell phones for, for, like Bell Communications, they wanted to control their switches, so the programmers over there created the language very efficient so it could work in both ways can talk to hardware easily, and at the same time, it's a high-level language. What is a high-level language and a low-level language? High-level language is me talking, you understanding. Low-level language is 1001, You don't understand anything, but CPU understands perfectly. Low-level languages run extremely quick because they are CPU language. High-level languages, they have to get translated into CPU language, we call that process compilation. And because of that, it's not as efficient as low-level language. But the problem is that in a low-level language, to write a for loop, you have to spend three weeks. <laughs> in C, you just got to write a for and it's done for you. So it's easier. And nowadays, the CPUs are so fast that it doesn't matter. So they wrote that language to do these things. They called it B, because it was Bell 
labs, right? And then after that happened, they improved it. They made a pr completely brand new version of it that was amazing. They say, what do we call it? They say, that was B, so let's call this one C. So that became the C language. Then this nerd guy saw the thing, the, the C language. Oh my God, this is amazing. But we cannot uh, solve complex stuff with it anymore. The programs and things that we want to write became so complicated. And they say, our brain is not capable of handling it anymore. We have to make the language act like what we have in real world. And what do we have in real world? Objects. They said we have to simulate an object outside of the programming schmigelidingi into the program, and they called it object-oriented programming. And because that feature was added to C, they called it C++, hence C++. Now, what is object-oriented programming? What is the simulation that we, were, we are talking about? What does it do, and, and why do we need it? OK, so I, I, I'm just seeing what you have so I can actually give you examples. So we have that one, too. And we have that one, too. Perfect. Good. So can I touch your coffee cup? OK. What, oh, that's fine. What does this do? You drink coffee out of it. That's one. Beautiful. So you can drink out of it. What else does it do? Huh? Holds liquid. Fine. Can I touch that? OK, what about this? She said same. That's a very important point. When you drink, coffee is going to come out of it? No. Coke is going to come out of it, right? But they are doing the same things almost, right? They're both disposable. One gets recycled. The other one kills the nature. Well, so but whatever, like when you look at it, but they are the same thing, right? You can drink out of it. So if I told you that I have, thank you, a water bottle, or I have a container that carry, you know what things it will do, right? You know what it is. If I told you I have a car, what are you sure about? Four wheels, good, no, not necessarily. Uh, wheels. Yeah, there are wheels that are more, definitely more than two. Okay, so there are wheels. What else? You're going too deep. Superficial. Be outside. Be a user and see what it is. Don't, don't be a builder. It can be driven. It has. So first of all, we've got to go what it has. What does, a, well, if you say a car, what are you sure a car has? Go. Steering wheel. Steering wheel. Engine. Engine. Not really. OK. See, I'm, I'm, I'm being precise. So nobody wants to stop, for heaven's sake? Seats, yes, seats, seats. Uh, it could have. It definitely has an accelerator, throttle, right? It has a brake that stops, right? Different types of it. Some of them have manual transmission. Some of them have uh, automatic transmission. Some of them have no transmission because they are electric. Some of them engines are ICE engines, internal combustion engine. The other ones are electric, but they all have those things. And if I tell you car, you understand what it is. That, that, the fact that if I told you this is an object and you tell me what it is, I'm going to tell you it's a phone, you know I can make a phone call with it. These days you can do whatever you want with it, but anyways, so any phone does that. You know I can dial a number. I can connect with someone. Else. You know what it does. So number one, all objects know what they do. You don't need to tell them anything. If I get this keyboard in my hand, you know its job is to type. You know. And if I told you I have a keyboard at home, you know what it does. It doesn't matter what it looks like. You know its functionalities. Correct? So what it does is the first thing that an object knows. Number two, specifications. That's the second thing. What is this keyboard? When I say a keyboard, is it an ergonomic keyboard? Is it a regular keyboard? Is it this many? Like, is the, does it have a keyboard pad? Does it have a numeric pad? Is it in English or it's in French or Arabic or I don't know, whatever language that you know, Persian, whatever. Uh, so you don't know what it is, right? So that's that. That's what it is. 
The, so two things an object has, what it does and what are the specifications for that one. This aspect is called encapsulation, putting the data and behavior together inside a package. You, in C language, went as far as only putting the specifications. Your structures couldn't do anything, right? But now it's different. You can actually bring the functions inside a structure. And doing that, your structure knows what its specifications are. So if I have an object called light bulb, I know I can, an object called lamp, I know all these things have some kind of a power. If I turn it on, each, each one will shed light of its own color. I don't need to tell it what to do. When I turn it on, it's blue. When I turn it on, it's white. When I turn it on, it's yellow. Everyone has its own things. I am a human being. I have brown eyes, no hair, come from the five different backgrounds. I don't want to even mention what am I, but that's what it is. You can, you, you, as a human being, you know what I am. You know I have eyes, you know I can see, you, can, you know I can talk. But when I talk, I talk like a male human being with three different accents mixed, right? Right? When someone else talks, they talk with their own thing. If you tell me to talk and I'm at home, I'm going to speak Farsi. If there is a person who's Chinese and speaks Mandarin, they ask them to talk at home, they're going to talk in Mandarin. So the action of talking for a person that is from China and speaks Mandarin is Mandarin speaking, right? The action of a guy who's from, who's an Iranian Canadian, when I talk, I speak Farsi, correct? We both talk. But the action of talk is done differently. An airplane flies. A mosquito flies. They both fly. They are both flying objects. Correct? But they are flying differently. This action is done, is called polymorphism. Polymorphism is doing the same thing in different ways. That's the second pillar, the second aspect of object orientation we're going to learn. Polymorphism has many different shapes, it's actually four major categories. We're going to learn that at the very end session of the, of the semester. When you learned all different ones, but we're going to say, that you did is this type of problem. The other one that you did is that. So we're going to tell you all different types of it. But we simulate the fact that you can do the same thing in different ways with C++, that's polymorphism. You're more worried than me, right? You keep looking at your watch. <laughs> OK, <clears throat> we're OK down to this point. We're okay down this point. Let's say you are coming from some village somewhere that nobody have ever seen a motorcycle, ever in their life. There are lots of bicycles over there, but no motorcycle, right? There are cars over there too, but for some unknown reason in that place in the world, they only have cars and they have bicycles, right? If you want to explain to them what a motorcycle is, what do you say? You say, hey, motorcycle is a bicycle with an engine, right? And they'll go, oh, I don't have the pedal anymore. It has an engine, right? So you explain what a motorcycle is from the feature it came from. They first built bicycles, then they found out what an engine is. They put an engine on a bicycle, they called it a motorcycle. Right? That is called inheritance. Inheritance is to rebuild your design to a new one. Some books, profs, people say it very definitely. They tell me, they tell, hey, uh, inheritance is uh, you have your mother's nose and your father's ears. That's not inheritance. I am not inheriting anything from my father. Me and my father are both instances of an object called male human. I'm not inheriting from my mother. My mother had a function called birth that returned a human, and that was me. You follow what I'm saying? If you tell me, Fardad, you're a mammal or you're a human being, that's correct. 
When I say a human being, you close your eyes, you can picture what I'm telling you. But you can't really, can you? You don't know what type of a human being you are dealing with here. Is he a man? Is he a woman? Is he gay? Trans? You don't know. You just know human being. The whole shape is there. You know they have eyes. You know they have hands. They have nose. They can walk. That's, that's what a human being is, right? Do we understand this? That's inheritance. Inheritance is to have an already built design and create a new thing out of it without re-implementing all the junk we had before. Don't tell me that it went to sleep, which means it didn't get recorded. I hope it got recorded. We'll see. <clears throat> Anyways, <clears throat> so are we okay down to this point? You put these three things together properly, not just like, you know, throw it in somewhere. Yeah. So they work with synergy with each other. So you have inheritance, you have polymorphism, you will see how. You put all these things together and you have yourself an object-oriented language. What is good about this an object-oriented language? What's good about an object-oriented language is that you don't have to remember what you have done. In a structured programming, you have to remember exactly what each function does and what does it receive, what does it do. If I want to print a, a, a teacher, display a teacher, what do I have to do? I have to write a function called print teacher that has an argument called teacher, put the teacher inside an army and pass to it. You know what it looks like? It looks like for me to be able to talk, I have to go to a booth and I turn on the booth and I start talking. No one else can talk. I have to get out, now it's his turn, going to the booth and talk. That's not the real world. We are all capable of talking. So teacher must have a function called show. Teacher, show yourself, done. Teacher knows how to show itself. You don't need to worry about it. In an object-oriented program, you design everything how they are supposed to be with respect of the abstraction of your problem and they will act the same way. So you don't need to worry about it. You create all the objects, you put them in a program, you say, shoo! Everything starts working perfectly. Because each teacher will have a student, each student will have a classroom, each classroom is assigned to a teacher. You put them together and everybody's gotta go to their places and everything works and school works. That's an ideal object-oriented program. Buzzwords. We don't have variables inside structures anymore. Anything that goes inside a structure, we call it either C++ terminology, member variable, object-oriented terminology, attribute, okay, or data. Attribute is better. So whenever you hear attribute, it means you have a variable inside, inside a structure. Number two, structures are referred to as classes. Because now you can put stuff inside that, you can put action inside the structure. Number three, a function that goes inside a structure, a function that goes inside the structure and gives capability to the structure has direct access to all the attributes of the structure. It's like in C, for C, C programmers to understand, a, cl a class method or a member function of a structure for a member function of a structure, all the member variables are global. They have, it has access to all of it. And that's the real world. If my nose itches, he won't itch his nose. I would do mine. You follow? That's real world. If my head hurts, he's not going to have an Advil. I will have an Advil. You follow what I'm saying? That's, that's the thing. So that's number one. That's number two was so. Number two, the member functions, they're either called functions inside the structure, either member functions or methods. We call them methods, okay? So if you hear method, it means there's a function that belongs to a structure. And it's against our object orientation religion to have any function that is not a member of a structure unless we have to. <laughs> unless we have to, okay? That's one of the powers of C++. Other object-oriented languages, you cannot have a non-member function. We can. 
and we call them helper functions. <laughs> but you are not supposed to. Okay, you should not get carried. We will see there is, comes a time that you just can't. You have to have something called a member function that we'll see. Yeah, that's it. So members, attributes, and abstraction is the most important. It has nothing to do with C++. Abstraction is uh, you essentially looking at what you need and throw away the things that are not needed. That's abstraction. If you can't do that, you cannot program. You are not a programmer. A programmer can look at it and say, okay, what do I need? And only uses those and ignores everything else. If you can't do that, it becomes something like an OCD. You're going to keep going and going, and your program never ends. And at the end of the thing, the guy wanted you to do accounting, and your program become, becomes, I don't know, Halo or some game. That you so you don't want that, right? You want to be, you know, be strict and know what you're doing and only take that part. Are we good? Are we okay, one? Are we okay, two? Sold. Okay, so, wow, I have four minutes to go. What do I do with my time? Okay, so, so that's it. So that's essentially it. We're going to spend the rest of the semester teach you these three things. Okay? And to be able to teach you what a class is, first we have to remind you what the module is. Because by standard, each class, each structure, must have its own header file and its own CPP file. Why? Because you, should, you need to know what a, an object is, that's header file, and what an object does, that's the CPP file. Is, header file, does, CPP file. Are we good? Thank you. See you on Friday if a new person is not found. Thank you. I hope I didn't bore you too much with screaming, but... <laughs>